and welcome to fifth, chapter 15, part three. We're going to talk about the fourth piece of information that gives us the most information about structure, but also is going to take us probably a little bit more time to understand. So when we talk about a signal, right, um, when we look at NMRs like the one on the previous slide, this is a signal that has multiple peaks within it, right? This is the a pattern. This whole um, signal here represents identical hydrogen. So what does this pattern tell us? Um, it may be referred to as multiplicity or splitting pattern. Um, and what you're going to be looking for are singlets, doublets, triplets, and quartets. That's what you're going to see most frequently. <coughs> And you will start to understand why as we talk about it. Quintets, sextets, septets, these are possible. These are a little bit tough sometimes, depending on the resolution, um, depending on how many hydrogen are being represented. Because remember, integration has to do with area under the signal. So if you have one hydrogen represented by a singlet versus one hydrogen in that area has to be split up over seven peaks right, it can um, start to make that signal small, and it can sometimes be hard to see those outer peaks. But you need to make yourself very familiar with singlet, doublet, triplet, and quartet. Um, sometimes they will be abbreviated, and you might see singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet. That's perfectly fine. But if you want to say quintet, you need to write it out, sextet, write it out, septet, write it out, um, so as not to be confused with quartets and singlets. Something else that you may see when something is uh, too messy to understand, you might see multiplet or M. Um, this can happen for a number of reasons. We are going to talk about a few of them. Uh, probably one of the and I'll point it out here because we will talk about it quite a bit. One of the areas where you frequently will see a multiplet would be in that aromatic portion. So let's scroll back here for a second and look at this signal here. This signal represents all of these aromatic protons. And you know that because it comes, you know, around that seven to eight region. So what will help you here more than the pattern would be the integration. So I know I have aromatic protons. If it integrates to five, well, then I know I have a mono substituted ring. We will see examples with those as we continue forward. All right. Now, why do we see these patterns? Let's talk about neighbors, right? So... Uh, splitting pattern arises from adjacent hydrogen types, okay? So if we look at this very, very simplified um, organic molecule here, and we don't focus on anything in these squiggly lines, the only thing to note is that there is not a hydrogen on whatever is attached right here. Um, HA and HB are in two different chemical environments. So from that, we know that there's not symmetry. At least one of these squiggly lines is different from the others. So we have two hydrogens, different chemical environments. They're going to produce different signals. Now, we know that the amount of energy that it takes right, to flip from alpha to beta spin state it helps us to determine where on our um, x-axis, you know, from 0 to 12, a proton is going to show up. It is because the spinning electrons, right, in the, electronic, uh, in the electron cloud create their own magnetic field that affects how each hydrogen type is affected by the magnet of the NMR. If hydrogens are spinning around and they're creating nuclei are spinning around, creating their own magnetic field, it's not unreasonable to think that they will affect each other, 
All right, if HA is affected by the electrons that are spinning around it, it's also going to be affected by HB, this nucleus over here that also has a magnetic moment. So HA is going to be affected by whether or not HB is in the alpha or the beta spin state. So if HA has one neighbor, then you are going to split that signal into two peaks because about 50% are going to have, uh, this is, right, this is the signal for HA here. It sort of get, looks like it's cut off. And so you'll have some that are, uh, you'll, you'll see representation of HBs, all of the molecules that have HBs going against the field versus with the field. Now, this is often called the N plus one rule. That is saying HA has one neighbor, and so it is split into two peaks, All right? So the N plus one rule is the number of neighbors plus one, and that will equal the number of peaks in your signal. Now, that doesn't tell us how many HAs there are, right? That comes from integration. It only tells us that this type of proton has one neighbor. So what about a triplet? If we have, if HA has two HB neighbors, then you have four different possible scenarios. Both HB protons can be going against the field or both could be going with. And you have two um, options where one is going with and one is going against. And so you're going to see fairly predictable um, height ratios in these patterns. The doublet is about one to one and the triplet is one to two to one because of the possibilities here. So again, this would integrate to one proton if there is only one HA, but that signal would be split into three because you have two neighbors. Two plus one is three. Now, there's. let's fix this slide real quick. Put HB in there. I'm not sure why that was left off. Um, if HA has three neighbors, then you wind up with four different options all against the field, all with the field, a combination of one with and two against, or two with and one against, right? And in these scenarios, you have three different options. So you see a predictable quartet pattern of one to three to three to one, right? And this is our quartet. Again, this if there's only one HA, integrates to one, but it tells us because there are four peaks that we must have three neighbors, right? Again, three plus one is four. Now, this can get complicated and we're gonna outline some rules for the pattern if we're analyzing these patterns, right? Um, it, it helps you determine the number of neighbors, but those neighbors have to be equivalent. So. For instance, if we look at, uh, oh, okay, they have to be equivalent and they have to be close enough together. So when will a neighbor cause splitting? Well, one, it will cause splitting if it is close enough, right? And so that is going to be between um two to three bonds away, right? The hydrogens aren't gonna be connected directly to each other. That would just be H2. Um, so we're looking at, if you, if you happen to have a CH2 that the H's are not equivalent, so if it's next to um, a chiral center uh, or somehow held in place and they're in different environments, they would definitely split each other. Vicinal hydrogen, so one, two, three bonds away. That is the most common. That's the most common splitting we're gonna deal with. 
One, two, three, four bonds away is too far. HA will not be affected by HB way down there. So they have to be close enough to split each other. So that is your first key rule here. Um, let's see. Now, your next key rule is N plus 1 applies only to, let's see, how do they say it here? Only to neighbors who are equivalent. So we're going to take a look at this example that they've drawn here, and I'm going to draw it out so I can uh, manipulate it a little bit. You have, let's go ahead and switch that up. You have three hydrogens here. You have a hydrogen there, the one that was highlighted in red. You have one more here, and you have three here. Now, one type of question in previous exams and quizzes that I've loved to give, and you will see it on your Grignard lab report, is give me a chart. Break this down. What would I expect to see in an NMR? So what, how many types of protons do I have? Okay, there's no real symmetry here. So this methyl group is one, and this methyl group is another. So for and we can call this one A, and we can call this one B. All right, then we've got an OH. That's we'll deal with OHs in a little bit. We're not we're not going to worry too much about that right now. We have this proton here, and then our protons that are on the double bond. Now, we will come back to this, but let's set the chart up. So let's say I'm going to have. Uh, proton uh, proton type, and that's where I'm going to put A, B, oh, I should have labeled them, shouldn't I? Okay, C, D, E, I did not plan well. Let's move this over a bit. Let's Okay, come on. Hello. Put type down there. <laughs> Sorry, y'all are gonna watch me do this in real time. There we go. Okay, E and F. Now, if we're analyzing this base just on what we know so far, there are a couple of them that we can determine. So, for instance, HA, this would integrate to three protons, right? So the signal would represent three protons, and the pattern would be based on the neighbors. Now, the only neighbor close enough to A is one, two, three away is D. There's only one D proton. So, A would be represented by a doublet. B is also going to integrate to three, it is only close enough to HF to be split, so it would also be a doublet. HD, or well, let's we'll come back to D. HF is split by B and E. So one of the first things people want to do is say, oh, well, there's four neighbors, so it'll be a quintet. But that's not right, because B and E are not the same. So since there are two different types, we are going to get complex splitting. We will come back to this slide here, to this uh, part of the whiteboard, and finish filling this in once we talk about complex splitting and how to deal with alcohols. So for now, just hold that, and we're going to keep talking. All right, now, another way in which... Uh, let's see, let's make sure I didn't skip anything. Complex splitting. Okay, there we go. Another important piece so that we can talk about complex splitting is the space between peaks in a signal. This is called a J value or a coupling constant. 
If you were to take a class where you just dived into spectroscopy, you would learn a lot more about J values and coupling constants. But here, I want you to understand um, how they're defined, right? This space in between these peaks depends very much upon the chemical environments of the proton that you have the signal and the protons that are splitting it. So in this example here on the slide, you have a pretty simple structure. You have a halo ethane. There's two types of protons and HA is split by HB. And since there are three HB protons, we get four peaks for HA, right? And this would integrate to two hydrogen. HB, you notice this triplet's a bit bigger. This would integrate to three hydrogen. And there's only two neighbors, so we get one, two, three peaks. We get a triplet. These are said to be coupled to one another. And it's easy to tell if two signals are coupled to each other because the space will be the same between the peaks and the two coupled patterns, right? A splits B and B splits A by the same amount, right? So when you see JAB or JAB J over here, that's just telling you this is the coupling between the A and the B protons. Um, that can be helpful if you're not sure if two signals go together. Right? If you know that you have a CH2 here and a CH2 here, and there's different splittings. Oh, I'm sorry. This isn't the slide I thought it was. Um, it, here we go. There. You can, if you're trying to decide if these two hydrogen and these three hydrogen are coupled to one another, you can tell by that coupling constant. So in this example... They have the same spacing, so likely these two go together. Here, this is not an ethyl group. At least they are not part of the same ethyl group because this spacing is so much bigger than this spacing. So this is being split by something other than the hydrogen that are represented here. Now, sometimes that can be tough to tell um, because it depends on the strength of the magnet. Um, different magnets uh, will give you, or sorry, stronger magnets will give you higher resolution. So sometimes you'll have um, signals that are a little bit harder to read, but maybe on a higher resolution instrument, they'll pull apart. That's not something for you to worry about in this class. I am not going to give you something that isn't clear, right? So that is very much a, just a uh, kind of a hands-on problem. So if you're when you're running your own NMRs, that's something to worry about. These two signals are running on top of each other. Now, there's while we're talking about J values here, um, hold that in your mind. They we've jumped along if we're following along with Klein into some uh, common patterns. Right, and the ethyl pattern, the isolated ethyl pattern is a very common pattern, right? You have the quartet and the triplet, quartet and triplet, quartet that integrates to two and a triplet that integrates to three. When I say isolated, that means there's nothing over here on the left that would cause additional splitting to that CH2. So isolated ethyls are very, uh, very easy to spot. Isobutyls, not isobutyl, what am I saying? Tert-butyl. Tert-butyls are also very easy to spot. Tert-butyl is a singlet that integrates to nine. To get nine identical hydrogen, regardless of the splitting, it's likely that you have three methyl groups. You'd have to have an enormous molecule with an enormous amount of symmetry uh, to get nine hydrogen to be a chemically equivalent. So the, when you've got these multiples of three, the most likely story is you have methyl groups. Now, it's not impossible that there could be symmetry and you these methyl groups aren't attached to the same carbon, but 
especially because it's an odd number, that's not super likely. And so it is fair to, um, it's fair to guess early on. If you see a nine hydrogen singlet, that's a T-butyl group. I, and the last one is an isolated isopropyl group. Again, isolated for the same reasons ethyl. When, if there was something with hydrogens directly attached, then this would be more complicated. But you wind up with, because all three, I'm sorry, all six of these hydrogen are identical, then the N plus one rule does apply, right? And then you get a septet. This wouldn't give you complex splitting here because both of these CH3s are identical. So you have a septet that gives you one hydrogen or that represents one hydrogen, sometimes kind of hard to read. And then you, the one that'll be easy is the doublet that is six hydrogen. If you have two methyl groups that are chemically equivalent, they are either on the same carbon or there is a lot of symmetry in your molecule. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, definitely, I would start with this one. Again, sometimes the septet can be a little tough to see because these two little outer peaks get real, real, real small. Now, how does this, knowing these patterns, knowing about J values, how does this come together to allow us to talk about complex splitting? Okay, we're going to take this example here of this propyl halide where we have, uh, one, two, three, and then we'll just put an X out here. You have A, B, and C protons. Now, A and C are easy. Right? If I look at proton A, it integrates to 3, and the pattern should be a triplet. A is split by B. There are two B protons, so A should be a triplet pattern. B is more complicated, and C is pretty easy. C would integrate to two hydrogens, but it would also be a triplet. So it would be easy to tell the difference between A and C because of integration and chemical shift from the halogen. But B is split by both A and C. Since A and C are not identical, so when neighbors are different types, that gives different J values. So what we're saying is that J, A, B, right, the splitting between A and B is not equal to J, B, C. So that creates uh, a more complicated pattern. Now, if you have a lot of resolution, that pattern may be really easy to see, or it may be more muddled, and that's when we use multiplet. Now, if I'm asking you to predict the pattern, I don't want you to predict multiplet. I want you to tell me what the pattern could be. So let's talk about where this came from. If, let's say that there's two options here. If J, A, B is greater than J, B, C, then we're going to look at the splitting in two parts. Right, so let's say we have the signal. The signal for HB is going to be split by the methyl group into a quartet. Right, and this, this space right here will be equivalent to JAB. You always do the larger one first. Then each signal that we've now created, each or sorry, each peak in the signal will be split, right? So first we have the AB splitting. Second, we're gonna have the BC splitting. Now BC, right, there's two C protons, so that's gonna split into triplets. Each one of these peaks from the quartet is split into a triplet, and this results in a quartet of triplets. Right? 
That is what this is. It maintains the same ratios that you saw for uh, quartets, one to three to three to one. The triplets maintain triplet ratios, one to two to one, all, all the way across, all right? And this is a very pretty complex signal. Now, what about if JBC is greater than JAB? Well, then we get the triplet splitting first, right? That's that JBC pattern. And then the JAB pattern splitting it further into quartets. This would be a triplet, and you see it over here, a triplet of quartets. Now, I would not expect you to know if JAB or JBC, which one is larger. So if I asked you to tell me what's the splitting around HB, I would expect you to be able to tell me that it was either a quartet of triplets or a triplet of quartets. You don't have to be able to tell which one, but you should be able to tell me one of those. All right, so you look at each neighbor. This guy splits me into quartet. This guy splits me into a triplet. Put the word of in between, All right? Quart quartet of triplets. Now, why that can be very difficult when reading a physical NMR. What if JAB and JBC are different, but they're really close, All right? So uh, let's put the complex multiplet. Let's say we've got that triplet first. And then the quartet is smaller, but not a lot smaller. So the quartet peaks start to run over each other and give us something that we can't really read the pattern for and we wouldn't want to try. And so this is very common. If you ever run in Amar, you are absolutely, absolutely going to see messy multiplets. And you will see them in some of the practice problems I give you. And the way I want you to handle that is deal with them last. Look at all the patterns that are clean and pretty and look at your IR information or whatever else has been given to you. And then see if that makes sense in the broader picture. So now that we know about complex splitting, oh, before we go back to that problem, I, I promised to go back to. There's an OH. We want to deal with that. Splitting does not occur, or let's say no splitting, uh, with OHs. So it doesn't matter how close a hydrogen is to, say, this CH2 here. It's within three bonds. Think of oxygen as a wall. The OH is not going to be split by or cause splitting of neighbors. So when I look at ethanol here, I have a quartet. That's the CH2 being split by the three neighbors. I have a triplet. That is the CH3 being split by the two neighbors. And I have a singlet where the OH is. The OH sometimes is... It doesn't quite integrate right, or it's really small or a little bit broad, and it can be anywhere between two and five, but you'll see it. It'll be, if you see it, it'll be one single peak. It will not be split. It, <clears throat> and here's the explanation of why. Um, the OH bond is a weak bond. It's more acidic than any CH bond. And so if you have any um, exchange, with your deuterated solvent and deuterium gets mixed in, you are going to wind up uh, seeing that. That's the reason why it might not integrate correctly. Um, it also, this exchange that occurs either with water or with other alcohols present or with deuterium uh, blurs that shielding and deshielding effect of the neighboring protons so you don't see it. So whether, I'm not going to ask you the whys on that one. If you just want to think of it as this is an oxygen wall, that's perfectly okay. So given all this information, let's go back and, oh, uh, where did I go? Here we go. 
Let's fill the rest of this chart in. Now, let's see is easy. It would be one, it would be a singlet, right? That OH, <clears throat> it's not gonna integrate to more than one and it's not gonna split or be split by anything. D, E, and F are all single protons, so they'll all integrate to one. D is being split by both A and E. So A is splitting it into a quartet, and E is splitting it into a doublet. So I can put quartet of doublets or doublet of quartets. E is being split by D and F, right? We have one, two, three, and then one, two, three. Those, that's all that E is close to. So E is going to be a doublet of doublets, right? There's only one D proton, there's only one F proton, so we're getting doublets on either side. There's, so there's only one answer for E. F is being split by E and B. It's being split into a doublet by E because there's only one E. It's being split into a quartet by B. So I can say a doublet of quartets or a quartet of doublets. There's no reason why I did something different here and here other than to just show you I can and you can. Because without knowing the coupling constants, I have no way of knowing which one would dominate that effect. So I, I do encourage you to review this and to, to practice um, in your grain yard lab. You are going to absolutely have complex splitting that you're going to have to tell me about in that lab report. Come see me if you have any questions. Okay. Now, I will make another video where I will talk a bit about how to use NMR to distinguish between compounds, and uh, we will go through carbon NMR. So that'll either be one or two more parts. Uh, thank you.